Arr, the kamikaze pirate is on the air. Ahoy, mateys! What kind of bilge water have you been putting out lately? Oh, wait, no. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be the masked professor in this. All right. Uh. What y'all don't know is I just recorded 30 minutes where I forgot to switch to uh, the um, uh, cam uh, to the uh, computer for about half of that, so I'm starting over. Oh, bloody hell. All right, so um, five weeks ago we were discussing Jidoku and we were in the section on Pokeyoki. So good Pokeyoki is very simple. It has a long life and low maintenance. It has high reliability. It has low cost. And it's designed for the workplace conditions. When we're thinking about how to make Pokeyoki, our shop floor team members are always our best source of information and ideas. All right, so next let's talk about inspection systems and zone control. Zone control. <coughs> Oh, bloody hell, I've been talking so long, I'm getting all dry. Um, uh, zone control means that each level of, our, of management is thinking in terms of their zone. So a team leader is thinking about his team and uh, about what's upstream and downstream from him. Right? Remember that the supplier and the customer are your upstream and downstream teams. Using zone control helps us create redundant controls on things that could go wrong. All right. Well, a lot of places still use uh, judgment inspections. Judgment inspections uh, have to do with uh, uh, discovering defects, but usually we're talking discovering detect, de de puh, puh. Um, discovering defects long after uh, they have been made. So we have good, no good inspections by dedicated inspectors. Uh, we hopefully are pre preventing our downstream activities from getting defects. But usually inspections are post-mortem activities and no feedback to production. Uh, but as has been pointed out so many times, you can't inspect in quality. All right, well, next are informative inspections, which are designed to discover um, uh, defects. Then to give feedback back to the source, take corrective action, but feedback and countermeasures often lag. This is still not real-time inspection. Uh, so, our best inspections are self-checks. The operator checks their own work. Uh, a U-shaped work cell is a particularly effective uh, place for this to work. Uh, and when we have downstream checking for defects, that gives very immediate feedback. 
right? So we want to uh, 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 we want that immediate feedback so we can stop the line if need be. Peer-to-peer -peer checks are the best. Some uh, inspections are required not to be uh, performed by the uh, operator uh, who did the assembly or installed the part, whatever. Very often, the operators will be cross-trained to inspect each other's work. When you get the supervisor checking or an inspector, it can seem very punitive. So, if we use source inspections that prevent defect, in our inspection methods are to discover errors and give very quick feedback. We can have vertical source inspections, and when we have a problem, we quickly do an up, upstream search for the root cause of that defect. This leads to problem solving and very strong feedback loops. And we should have feedback loops that work both upstream and downstream. Then we have horizontal source inspections. That is where we start seeking the root causes within the department, right? So the, the person next to me may be making a defect and handing it off to me, but it may be because of something else in the department that is causing that defect. So feedback loops between supervisors uh, within each department are also extremely helpful. All right, so next, turn in your hymnals. Oh, wait, no, sorry. That, totally the wrong, uh, uh, totally the wrong tack. Okay, uh, on page 130, there's a gray box that says, can we really just stop the line? So Jadoka is three things. We don't accept defects, we don't make defects, and we don't pass on defects. All right, don't make defects comprises first, detect the defect, or even better, the error that precedes that defect. Two, stop the process. Three, call for help and fix the immediate condition. Four, solve the problem at the root cause so it doesn't happen again. Okay. Stop the process is a very difficult one for most workers to accept, right? It has been uh, uh, mass production has been the watchword for so many years, and that means that uh, people are used to saying, "Oh, we got to keep going, we got to keep producing, we got." But Toyota says, stop the line so that the line never has to stop. We have to eliminate these defects because otherwise we get into a rework situation or we're passing on defects to customers and um, then, of course, the customers get mad because they have a de defective uh, product. All right, so using Pokeyoki, effective Pokeyoki, uh, first of all, it inspects 100% of items. You get your, um, 
uh, work in process from the guy up uh, next upstream. He, um, uh, so then you put it in a jig or your Pokeyoki device, whatever, and it tells you, wait, no, there's a problem, a hole hasn't been drilled, uh, uh, something hasn't been welded, whatever. So we get immediate feedback that compels uh, uh, countermeasures. So we have source inspection, which is error prevention, and informative inspections, which are defect prevention. All right, so there are two kinds of actions that can be uh, used uh, depending on the level of a problem. One is to shut down. Uh, a lot of times this can be done in an automatic way, uh, kind of the automation idea uh, that each year uh, Toyota invented so long ago. So we want automatic detection of errors and not allowing the process to go forward if there's an error. Detection that a queue is full should stop the process as well. Again, we don't want a superfluous inventory. And if a part has been misplaced, in other words, it's not sitting in its jig, its fixture, uh, whatever, that uh, uh, correctly, it stops the process. So, a warning should alert us to the abnormalities that we're seeing. Um, very often, there will be kind of a supervisor's and on board. That can alert us by lights and or music that there's a possible problem. Or can be engaged uh, when a team member pulls a cord, an and on cord, at their location. Often, of course, we have and on lights at the workstation. Hmm, let's say that. When somebody pulls an and on cord, the line is going to continue to move until every product is at its next position. Uh, that means that we don't get into a problem because people stopped their ordinary process in the middle and then have to uh, try and remember where they are. All right, so we have three paths to Pokeyoki. The first is workplace deviations. Uh, one of those deviations can be the weight is wrong. So we can put in sensors that detect an abnormal weight. Another deviation could be the dimensions are wrong. So we need to, uh, of course, we have standards for our dimensions, and we can identify non conforming dimensions by limit sw switches, stoppers, jigs, photoelectric eyes. Um, and, you know, there's more and more ways to uh, detect that. And our third path to Pokeyoki is shape. We have standards for uh, the number and position of holes. Uh, angles, curvature. And we want to detect the deviations from those standards by the use of limit switches, locator pins, 
interference in, in shoots or other uh, 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 methods of moving our, um, our product. Now, of course, none of this is a comprehensive uh, list because new ideas uh, and new technology is coming online all the time. Second, we have work method deviations. So sometimes we'll have sensors detect errors in the standard motions. Maybe with a photoelectric sensor that counts the number of times a hand break or an arm breaks the beam. Uh, a counter counts the number of spot welds. Uh, we, our goal is always organize the work so that the downstream processes can't proceed unless the upstream processes have been completed. So drilling and welding, the work piece uh, can only be done if the drilling is complete. Um, when we have assembly of multiple models, in other words, we have our mixed model production, our photoelectric sensors detect the characteristic shapes of the different models. Part of it is going to be deviations from fixed values. So, the, uh, some of the counter methods we can use a limit switch to count the number of holes. Uh, we can count the number of times a weld tip is used and know to change it when uh, we reach a certain count. We can uh, use myth missing parts methods. When we use kitting, if there are leftover parts, hey, that's signaling there's a problem. Uh, we can use critical conditions, deviations, uh, a pressure gauge that shuts down the process if it's over or under pressurized. Thermal couples shut down a, a, a process for excessive temperatures or even deficient uh, temperatures. It might be that a motor is overheating. It also might be that a uh, baking oven uh, to dry paint uh, isn't hot enough anymore. We can have torque wrenches that provide torque only in the target range at a certain workstation. All right, so what are our Pokayoki detection methods? Uh, first of all, there are contact sensors. Limit switches and micro switches, that's widely applicable. Uh, differential transformers so that we can detect changes in the magnetic field from whether a part is in place or not. Uh, touch switch that will signal the presence or absence of the part. There are non-contact methods, um, photoelectric devices, metal passage detectors, temperature detectors, pressure sensors, electric current fluctuations, and we want to take a look on page 135 and 136 all right so here we see that a car is being loaded onto a, a rail car. Um, uh, 
Um, so, uh, before the improvement, a car smashed into the top of rail car during loading. Uh, rail cars belong to the rail firm and their dimensions vary widely. Um, uh, so, and their pokeyoki was cut a piece of wood to de desired length, label and color code the wood, attach a chain to the wood, and make a home position for it. Amend standardized work to include height checking. All right, so that was figure 6 2. Um, on figure six free, uh, three, uh, preventing omission of board set mounting holes. Okay, so here you have a, a drill process goes to a multi-spot welder. Uh, that's for office furniture, drilling and spot welding. Workers occasionally neglected to drill mounting holes on pieces. So, the Pokeyoki put a limit switch on the drilling machine and alarm sounds if the correct number of holes have not been drilled. Uh, okay, and we also have uh, uh, figure 6-3 and figure 6-4 um, uh, those are on page 136. Uh, however, I'm going to let y'all uh, look at those yourselves. All right, so even more on Pokeyoke. Um, um, in Jadoka, our process is detect the defect or the error preceding it, stop the process, call for, helps, uh, for help, and fix the immediate condition, and solve the problem at the root cause. All right, so Pokeyoki is central to these steps one through four. Um, So, we are relying on uh, Pokeyoki to catch errors uh, that are uh, closer to the source of their happening. Uh, and Pokeyoki foster, fosters respect for people. Now, respect for people I don't know if I've spent a lot of time talking about that, but that was one of the tenets that Taichi Ono insisted be part of this, that uh, be part of uh, uh, the Toyota system or lean. Uh, so, what we are doing is we are looking at systemic causes and not just finger pointing. You made an error! Oh, yeah, well, great, fantastic. And I'm sure we've all seen situations where, um, uh, we've all seen situations where we, uh, um, supervisors have pointed uh, fingers at people when in fact they're not at fault it's actually the system or the tools or some other outside element that is the fault. That also brings in Deming's pride of workmanship. Um, okay so implementing um, the uh, uh, Jadoka hmm. 
That's interesting. All right, so we have to ask the following questions. How will we measure the capability of each process? How will we involve our um, team members? What kind of knowledge will our... Um, ooh, worst spelling of Pokeyoki ever. Uh, what kind of knowledge will our team members require to make Pokeyoki? How will we uh, train them? What is the role of the team member, the supervisor, the manager, and the executive in the process? How do we link Jadoka with 5S, with standard work, and TC, uh, TPM? How will we communicate and, uh, and promote Jadoka? All right, so one thing we want to do with Jadoka is we want to have a strategy and goals, right? That strategy should be part of our broader lean strategy. We need uh, promotion and communication. We need uh, training, and we need measurement and reporting. We want to be sure that we're using SMART goals. And you'll notice SMART is capitalized. Uh, Uh, meaning that it's got to be the spe uh, specific, measurable, artic articulable, realistic, and timely uh, set of goals. We want to measure the number of Pokeyoki implementing uh, Kaizen's su suggestions, etc. Um, the percentage of uh, team members that are trained in uh, Jadoka. Okay, now we're getting to the part, hey, what happened? Um, the, our percentage of team members that are involved in Jadoka activities. Uh, all right, so what are our future directions? Oh, come on. Uh, first of all, we want to make sure that the system compels improvement. Um, we always want to get to a place where our culture is that we always are working on to, uh, uh, to improve the system. We want to define our capability and our containment levels. By containment level, uh, what the author means is our pokeyoki is set up in a way that we can easily find errors or defects and quickly correct them. We want to be able to translate these to some kind of a score. It could be a numerical score or it could be a bronze, silver, gold, platinum, whatever. We want our assessment uh, system to be simple and not dependent on statistics. We do want a, 
a, a, a quality control department probably, but we want a very small one. Our average team member must be able to assess and develop improvements. And obviously it takes time uh, to get there. Our system should provide guidance uh, on improving uh, scores. And I'm going to go through uh, Jadoka outside the factory, uh, it's one of your gray boxes on page 138. Man, all that material and all we got to was uh, 138. Well, you know what, I'm going to read it so I'm going to, uh, so I'm going to skip uh, putting on the camera view. Jadoka and its constituent concepts, zone control, pokeyoki, total involvement, have enormous potential in healthcare, financial services, education, and public service. Consider hospital mismedications, which are implicated in over 100,000 deaths each year in American hospitals. Hmm doesn't make the COVID uh, seem that bad, does it? Here's what a nurse needs to know before delivering a drug intravenously. Is this the right patient? Is this the right drug? Is this the right dose of the drug? Is the drug in the correct form? Uh, in other words, should it be diluted or administered with a drip IV? Is the patient taking other drugs that might make this drug dangerous? People are not wired for infallibility. Can we expect a nurse or doctor to answer these questions on her own in a crisis at 3 a.m.? Jadoka in the form of embedded tests for each question can greatly reduce mismedication frequency. Staying in healthcare Hand hygiene is a major factor in the infections that kill tens of thousands of Americans each year. Some hospitals are turning to pokeyokis in the form of buzzers, lights, and other trackers that signal annoyingly when workers fail to sanitize. Jadoka is also very helpful in the financial services sector. Credit card and mortgage applications, for example, require accurate input of many pieces of information. Pokeyokis can greatly reduce defect levels. Can we not there, thereby engage the good people doing the work? Jadoka's constraint outside the factory is not technical, but cultural. Can we really engage everyone in improving our work? Well, words to live by. Now this is a, a very, uh, a very uh, uh, timely and crucial. There are over 100,000 deaths in hospitals from preventable causes wrong drugs, wrong dosage of drugs, infections, uh, other errors in the process. Um, in fact, a, a few years ago, uh, some celebrity who I don't remember who it is, had, uh, he and his wife had uh, twin boys. When the boys were sick, they took them to the hospital and uh, there was a drug that would uh, help their condition, so it was administered to both. The thing was, one boy lived and the other one died because uh, the, uh, 
they were each administered a different strength of the drug. But there was no kind of pokeyoke about which one was which strength. Subsequently, the drug company uh, changed uh, the way they labeled the drugs so that, uh, so that one strength had a certain color label and the other strength had a different co color label. Okay, well, well, how did that happen? Okay, I, uh, I accidentally pulled out the flash drive, I'm not sure how, uh, and yet my outline persists. Um, all right, so rolling right over from chapter 6, Jadoka, into chapter 7, Involvement. So our introduction, how do we involve our team members? What skills will they need to become involved? How will we support and sustain improvement? How will we measure involvement? And what is the role of management? All right, so why involvement? Uh, to begin with, involvement goes against the old-style management practice, what I often refer to as um, the 19th century school of management. A lot of the 19th century school of management is based on Frederick Taylor's theories of scientific, scientific management. Um, um, but now we know better. No, Frederick Taylor did a great thing in his day. But again, the world has evolved and our workers have evolved. So today's workers are better educated and more literate than ever. All right, well that is a good thing. The reason that Japan and America have the highest productivities per worker in the world is because of the education and the literacy in those two populations. Today, companies need flexibility and creativity. Um, And let me, all right, I'm afraid to switch now, lest I forget to switch back. All right, so at most organizations, we have the management, the top management here, and they have very few problems, but very big problems. Then we have middle management, and they have few medium-sized problems. And then we have the uh, lowest level of management, managers and supervisors, and they have many small problems. And that can leak over into the actual uh, uh, workforce. So we need to get all of these people working together because solving these small problems helps solve these medium-sized problems, which helps solve the big problems. Oh, right. And switch. All right. 
thick dog. All right, so we need everyone to get involved. Now, that old 19th century style of management, we still see taught in our business schools and often in our engineering management courses. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes that is now called MBAism, that I can manage my company without ever going on the shop floor. All I have to do is look at the numbers on my computer. What a crock of, well, I'm sure you can infer. Okay, so um, in the section, A Terrible Waste of Humanity, oh, the humanity, one huge waste that I have seen many, many times in industry is people watching machines work and not having to adjust the machine, not having to stop the machine. They're just there watching it work. That was how Taiichi Ono identified that team members need to be more involved. Now, a lot of times it's assumed that the Japanese are better at in involvement because their culture is one where there is more respect given to people on every level of society than we see in uh, Western nations, where very often you'll see that people, uh, uh, the uh, custodian is doing his job and uh, the worker on the floor looks down on him because I'm more skilled, I'm doing something better. The supervisor looks down on the worker, I have more skills, I am better. Uh, but really, American workers are eager to get involved. Um, what we want to do is create an atmosphere of mutual respect. That mutual respect reinforces the idea of secure employment. Now for a greenfield factory, that's super easy. We, we just uh, built the factory. We've just installed all the machines. Um, we have hired the workers. We have exactly the number of workers we need. In fact, if there's going to be any change in workers, it's sometimes going to be because uh, of things like, oh, we don't have enough maintenance personnel. Uh, we don't have enough uh, uh, people in the shipping and receiving department. Things like that. Unfortunately, that's not the reality in a, in a brownfield facility. Often in a brownfield facility, we have way more workers than we can justify keeping if we want the company to stay in business. So, first of all, we need to be upfront with our workforce. We don't say, oh, everything's fine, and then we start laying people off, that's going to kill morale. Can we guarantee that security for all? Well, possibly not. As I said, if we have way too many people, um, and there is not really a realistic possibility of keeping them all employed, then we're going to have to make some changes. How do we make that uh, transition easy? Um, well, one way is what the hell? Uh, one way is to offer 
early retirement packages, right? Somebody's got in 28 years and usually the kit pension kicks in at 30. Tell you what, buddy, you got two extra years of retirement. Of course, some people are going to be way too young for that. They'll have worked for the company for a few years or even just started recently. In that case, we offer to help them with worker training or sending them to college so they can get another job. When we have trimmed down to the correct number, then we're going to commit to job security for the remainder of the people. All right, and now I want to go through the illusion of top-down control. All right, so Fred Taylor uh, separated planning from production. Product productivity soared, but it was at a terrible cost. Frontline team members were alienated and managers were infected with the illusion of top-down control. The Taylor system fostered mental models such as we can manage from a distance by the numbers. That MBAism, uh, MBAism that I talked about before. What can frontline team members possibly teach us? Improvement comes when smart people, like us, tell frontline people what to do. Such thinking it afflicts us still. It is so ingrained that few even question it. Our professional and business schools are rife with it. Um, now, I don't want to be misunderstood. I learned a great deal in engineering and business school. But I also absorbed unhelpful thinking that took a decade to overcome. I know, I feel chastened. Um, Uh, skepticism. Get it? Hold on to it. Alright, so what are activities that focus, uh, that support involvement? Well, we can focus on Kaizen Circle activity as the uh, uh, as the author calls it, practical tr Kaizen training, uh, and uh, suggestion programs. Our goal of involvement What the hell is going on with this? Um, our goal of involvement is to solve specific problems in our company, our organization, our factory, whatever. So, part of it may be containment by increased uh, uh, pokeyoki, reducing transportation by changing our layout, or a single minute exchange of die events to reduce our changeover times. Uh, another one is to reduce hassles, right? So part of that is the creation of production control boards or 5S or 6S, whatever we call it. We want to reduce our risk. That may be by reducing the ergonomic burden, 
so that we don't have cumulative trauma disorders um, uh, popping up uh, to eliminate uh, pinch points or other hazards. In other words, any kind of safety um, problem where we can uh, put a shield or some other device that will uh, help to keep from uh, help to keep from uh, 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 injuring our workers uh, and to implement Pokeyoki. We also want to improve our team member capability. So there's never going to be a shortage of uh, problems. Just not going to happen. Uh, so we want to improve their problem solving, and we want to strengthen our people. And uh, we want to talk about uh, quick and easy uh, Kaizen. Uh, this is on page 147 in your book. I'm not going to switch to camera view lest I make another mistake. Okay, getting started. Quick and easy Kaizen. Everyone is afraid of change. It's how we're wired. Our brain comprises three sections. The limbic brain, the oldest reptilian part, which controls basic functions, including the fight or flight response. The mammalian brain, which contains our emotional center. And our prefrontal cortex, our managerial center. When we face change, the limbic brain kicks in and we feel anxious. The bigger the change, the greater our anxiety. Quick and easy Kaizen, or Kaizen uh, I -N? Hmm. Not quite sure how to say that uh, in Japanese. Entails small improvements in day-to-day -day work identified and implemented by individual team members. With time, fear subsides and Kaizen becomes a habit. Moreover, small changes can add up to big improvements. Develop a quick and easy Kaizen system. Use visual management in the form of simple pocket cards and a quick and easy Kaizen board so everyone can see what's happening. Review ideas during daily team huddles. Keep the approval process simple. Uh, in other words, immediate supervisor approves for volume and speed. If you stick with it, a benevolent cycle of evolves. People feel good seeing their ideas in action, which leads to more improvement ideas. You'll be impressed by what people come up with. Um, all of uh, this is, uh, is very true. Um, in terms of the psychology of how we get people to make improvement. In fact, at times, I have had the situation where I go to a, a team member or team members and I say, look, we have to get this done. Right now, I have no idea how to do that. So I am going to rely on you guys to come up with something uh, and we'll see if it works. Obviously, this is not our usual management methodology at all. Uh, but I have had really great results 
sometimes just turning people loose on a problem and saying, hey, come up with a solution. Make this happen. Uh, if you have obstacles, yes, come, uh, come to me and I'll try and remove those. All right. Our um, author calls it Kaizen Circle activity. Um, in my personal lexicon, I call it uh, lean events. You always have a lean team or a Kaizen team for each Kaizen event. And, but what the author is saying and what I'm saying are exactly equivalent. All right, so uh, Kaizen events are a well-known way that we have in, uh, uh, people involved in the process. Um, it has benefits. First of all, it's going to strengthen team member ability. They learn better how to work as part of a team. Uh, part of it may be learning to lead a team, how to think more clearly and logically, and how to solve problems. It's also going to build team member confidence. Team members will know that they are contributing uh, and it will make them more ready for challenges in the future. It means that we're acting on critical problems with hundreds of hands. That was a way that uh, Taiichi Ono and the early fathers of Lean um, described um, uh, Kaizen activity is that you're bringing a lot of focus to a problem to fix it. All right, so the structure of a, a Kaizen event or a Kaizen circle activity, uh, a manager with a problem uh, is what triggers it and he will act as the sponsor. Uh, sometimes uh, they don't call it sponsor, they call it champion. Uh, just kind of depends on what schema of lean you're in. All right, so usually when we have a lean event, we have six to eight members. That may vary depending on how much has to be changed. If we are doing a 3P event, we may have everybody in a shop in there, even if uh, with their suppliers and their customers, um, uh, to make sure that we arrange things in the best possible way. All right, so you have weekly meetings for six to eight weeks, about an hour long. People are given assignments. Uh, you go study this process and, um, and videotape it and let's create a work measurement standard. Uh, you uh, go and research the historic methods, uh, the historic records on what the amount of production has been and uh, what quality problems, et cetera, et cetera. We have, in the middle there, we have one week of intense activity. Everyone comes together. Uh, they work with the shop floor workers to solve the problem. Then you have a, a few weeks of follow-up uh, after that to make sure that changes that can't be done in that week of intense activity uh, are followed up. The tools are ordered. Um, the uh, riggers come in and move the machine, whatever is needed. Okay, so 
This time I am going to have to change. And I say change or crawl. That old revolutionary uh, motto. All right, so we have the uh, roles going down the left on figure 7.1, responsibilities on the right. So a circle member attends the meetings, contributes ideas, uh, may help to choose and analyze a problem, and recommend and implement solutions, and make presentations. The facilitator attends the training, uh, guides the members through the problem-solving process, attends the circle meetings, and completes and submits the uh, uh, Kaizen event meeting records. An advisor attends training, provides technical or administrative advice, attends the circle meetings, helps coordinate presentations to management. The circle trainer develops and conducts the training, attends circle meetings if requested, provides solve, uh, tr problem solving training if requested, collects meeting records and reports to management. And the manager encourages the circle formation involvement, periodically checks the circle pro uh, progress and offers suggestions, approves recommendations and attends presentations. All right, so, but keep in mind that there can be a crossing between these roles. The facilitator and the advisor might be the same person. For that matter, a manager might be a circle member. If they're inexperienced at Kaizen, they need to go through events learning how to, uh, uh, how to do Kaizen. For that matter, the manager might be the facilitator as well because he has a lot of experience and training. Uh, and for that matter, the facilitator might also be the circle trainer or the advisor might be the circle trainer. Okay, so uh, we can see there are different roles uh, and responsibilities that go with those roles within the Kaizen event um, uh, planning, execution, etc. Or Kaizen circle activity, whatever you want to call it. All right, so, ow. Uh, oh, there we go. So Kaizen circle activity training one thing is to have uh, teach people administrative skills. How to hold a team meeting. How to make assignments. How to take minutes. This is a crucial skill that too few people have learned. One problem that I see with students is, uh, here is that often They've never learned to take notes properly and don't know how to study properly. Uh, prepare presentations, uh, that is part of it as well. We want to have brainstorming that involves all our circle members. We want to have training in problem solving, and presentation skills. Kaizen Circle Activity Administration. First of all, we'd like to have a Kaizen Circle Activity Department. Sometimes this is called the Lean Office or uh, the Improvement Office. Uh, we want them to create standard forms. When we have standard forms, everyone knows 
will learn how to read it properly. We want them to register new circles. We want them to record the results of circles. We want them to report the macro Kaizen circle or Kaizen event results. In other words, we did this many activities uh, in the welding act, uh, the welding department. Uh, we are uh, because of this we have implemented. Because of this we have implemented so much in the way of uh, of cost savings and so much in the way of um, uh, so much in the way of uh, uh, space saved, so much, you know, all of this. And they need to be responsible for the training. All right, so on figure 7-2 on page 150, the next page from where I was last time. All right, so this is, oh, now it's too big. Uh, uh, uh. All right. This is uh, a, uh, a sample report format, okay? It doesn't have to look like this, but our report should always fit on one page, right? You don't want to get into a thing where you have to read 10 pages to find out what the hell happened in a Kaizen event. Uh, often we'll make our presentations much longer, uh, but there you go. All right, so that was on page 150. Now, one thing we want to do is we want to promote having Kaizen events or Kaizen Circle activities at Toyota, what they do is they have report boards in the production areas and high traffic uh, kita tubing. Uh, that should be location. Oh, bloody hell. How did I miss that badly? One way to promote is to have plant-wide circle competitions and awards. That can be for productivity, that can be for safety, quality, cost, or the environment, which could mean the larger environment of the earth or the environment of the plant. The competitions then are judged at the head office by senior personnel, okay, and the, um, that must be done without fear or favor. So the role of our manager, our manager must support the Kaizen Circle activity promotion. Um, must stay in daily communication with our team members and must keep them up to date on what are critical issues for the company. Uh, what are problems in our managers and our team members area. Um, what, um, what are management's expectations for our Kaizen Circle activity around important themes? For example, we might be really worried at one time about quality or we might be worried about safety, uh, right? And that could be anything, uh, uh, right? We might be having a lot of rework while we need to work on why do we have that. 
Uh, um, so, as our Kaizen Circle activity members become more knowledgeable, we're going to focus more and more on specific goals. When they're just learning, we're going to start with very general problems that should be easy to problem solve. But as they get better and better, we want them to focus in more and more on, uh, on things that um, um, on things that become more and more specific uh, to uh, more difficult problems. All right, in addition, we want them to consider how we increase our Kaizen events in their area. We want to regularly check what are the themes that the company is uh, uh, emphasizing right now. Is it quality? Is it productivity? Is it cost cutting? Is it safety? Is it environment? We want to know what our expected uh, uh, estimated, excuse me, dates of completion for each uh, Kaizen event team. What is the status of each Kaizen event team, right? This is a time that our managers can say, hey, what's going on? They can say, well, look, we're having a problem uh, because uh, shipping and receiving hasn't been able to get the tools that we need to give these guys to improve productivity, right? And maybe he can bring, he or she can bring um, uh, pressure to bear that will help get that problem solved. Um, the, our managers need to personally check on the Kaizen event members. You know, just something like, how's it going? Hey, how do you feel about this event you're in? Um, let's actively support our our circles by having problems and having ideas, say, well, wait, could we, uh, 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 you guys are, are kind of stuck on this. Could we do something like they did over in uh, uh, the assembly of this other product line? Take them over there, show them what they did to improve that. Maybe that gives them an idea that would uh, be useful. The manager should always personally view the results uh, for each Kaizen event team uh, and personally thank the members. So, damn it, I'm out of tea. Uh, all right, so I am going to call our traditional class break before I go into how will you motivate, uh, motivate people, Pascal San. Uh, all right, uh, so hang on a second. This is our May 1st lecture, part one, and uh, part two will be on another link on your Moodle.